Good morning and welcome to Magnify. My name is G. I am one of the many volunteers in this place, and we are so glad that you are here with us today. If you are streaming this service from any uh, device at home or any stream service, welcome. We are so happy to have you. Guys, you are very social distance. You are overachievers here. Awesome. Wow. I was going to ask you to smile to your neighbor, but probably I'm going to ask you to just wave. <laughs> it's like two blocks, remember, six feet away, <laughs> right? We are going to have a really awesome time worshiping our Lord God. We're going to sing a few songs. We are going to have communion. So if you haven't gathered the, the elements, they are right there at the entrance. And also we're going to hear from our uh, lead pastor, Matt Senya. He's going to keep continuing the teaching over uh, Ashes, to beauty. So that is a great series. So at this moment, I'm going to invite you and sing with us. Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand, if you haven't already, and let's sing. Your grace, God, I need it every day. It's 
Amen. That was a lot of fun. John, 1 John 3 says this, See what great love the Father has for us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is who we are. I can think of another way to describe that as we are so drenched, so lavished with his love. As we keep entering into worship this morning, let's have that in mind as we sing of God's great love for us. Sing, oh precious. We're singing, oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. I am washed, I am drenched in love All souls atoned by the blood of the Lamb I'm not a slave to what will tell me damn How beautiful that cleansing flood I am washed, I am washed, I am drenched in love
thieves will come confess and know that you are holy and know that you are holy and all will sing out hallelujah and we will cry
Well, good morning again. Thank you for being with us. You can take your chairs now and get comfy. My name is G. I am one of the many volunteers in this place, and we are so glad that you are with us today, worshiping our Lord God. It is a fantastic day to do that. And if you are new with us today, we just want to say thank you for being with us. We want to know you. We want to connect with you. Not shake hands, but we can do the coronavirus shake you know, like this. But really, we would like to, to get to know you. Help us make this church your church so you can take the next step to be with God here together and worship Him. Well, since we already know many of you, we would like to let you know that we have such a great website. And this website helps us to keep uh, the good information out there. What's going on here, what, what's not going on, and we would like to encourage you and invite you to go and visit this website. It contains all the information that is related to Sunday's activities and church activities. And talking about that, we have two great opportunities this month. The first one is that we are going to celebrate baptisms at the end of the month. And if you haven't done this and you want to tell your story, we want to encourage you to find somebody between services or at the end of this service, and you can tell them your story. Uh, you can identify these people because they are wearing lanyards and some masks, well, biting your, their eyes at you, saying hi. So you can go and tell your story before you get baptized. We want to encourage you to do that. But also, we are going to start uh, gathering in small groups, and this is a fantastic way to get connected to this church. And we would like you to participate in that, and you can find all this information in our website. We want to thank, we want to give you a great thank you, you know, like big one, because when you give to this place, you are taking partnership of doing all these things that I'm talking about. And your generosity shows, and it's not only here locally that gets done, but there is also things outside this community. And we just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for partnership with us. We want to pray now, and I would like to invite you to bow your heads, and let's talk to our God. Lord, thank you because you are good to us. Your mercy and your love is always looking out for our soul, for our heart and our mind. We just want to say thank you because you are so, so, so good to us. Today we come to you and we would like to say a prayer for those that are facing medical challenges in our community. That your healing hand be with them and also your support and your encouragement to take them through these steps. We know that you can do all things good and new again. We just want to ask you that you be with them. We want to pray for those that also have lost people that they love. And they may, they may be very in pain in their hearts, feeling that emptiness, because when somebody leaves us, it's like that. But we know that you can fill that space. We know that you can give us the peace and give us the love and the encouragement to go through those. We just want to ask you that you be with them as well. We want to pray for those that are working in your kingdom and reaching out people that they don't know you. We just want to pray for Bob and Patty and Oscar and what they're doing today. Help them to complete that translation of the New Testament. Help them to go through the different challenges that they may be facing, not only in the ministry, but also in their personal life. We just want to ask you that you keep supporting them and providing for all their needs. God, open our hearts, open our minds so we can learn from your word. Talk to us and help us be more like you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Good morning. If you have a Bible with you or nearby you at home, please turn to the book of Proverbs and Proverbs 23. And our scripture this morning will be verses one through three. Proverbs 23, one through three. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Well, who would you say is the greatest athlete of all time? Who would you think of when you think of competition and and sports? What names come to mind? For any of you, I wonder if the name uh, Joey Chestnut came to mind. And I'm guessing for most of you, probably all of you, that name did not come into your head. And even as I say his name, you're probably thinking, who is that? And until recently, I didn't know who it was, but I was at a family gathering and my brother was there, my brother-in-law was there, and they began talking about a competition and uh, the main competitor they were talking about was Joey Chestnut. And Joey Chestnut is the world's best ever hot dog eating champion. And these two guys, my brother and brother-in-law, were talking about him because he had just won another championship, giving him an unprecedented string of championships unmatched in any other sport, if you consider hot dog eating a sport, which some people do. Because I asked them, who is Joey Chestnut? And they started telling me. So later that day, I pull up uh, on the computer. I go to ESPN to see if they had anything on this competition. And sure enough, it was right on the front page. And there's Joey Chestnut. And there's a video of him and the female division winners. And so in the hot dog eating championship, they have 10 minutes to eat as many hot dogs as they can. So the video was only about a minute. So it's kind of like the last minute uh, and they only have 10 minutes to do this. So I click on the video and uh, I watch the end of Joey Chestnut's uh, record breaking run and Uh, It was probably one of the most disgusting things I've ever watched because he is taking to get these hot dogs down. You've got to eat the hot dog in the bun and they're dipping the the, the, uh, buns in water so they go down and then they're kind of forcing this hot dog in their mouth and down their throat. But they're trying so hard to do this, they're actually sweating and there's water and and pieces of bun and hot dog uh, all over the place. So, So it's a disgusting mess. But Joey Chestnut, in 10 minutes, ate 74 hot dogs, 21,000 calories. So as I thought about taking us to the next step in our uh, series on the seven deadly sins, and we're on gluttony today, I immediately thought of Joey Chestnut. And as we think about gluttony, uh, a lot of us will do the same thing. When we think about gluttony, we think about other people or maybe sometimes ourselves eating a ton of food, way too much food. And in some ways, Thanksgiving is kind of this nationally accepted day of, of gluttony. But when we look at it through the Christian lens, uh, a biblical lens, and as Christ followers, we have to understand something deeper about gluttony. And so as we think about going and traveling this road from gluttony to temperance, we have to understand gluttony much better. Because I like to think of guys like Joey Chestnut eating 74 hot dogs as being gluttony. Because I will usually get filled up around three hot dogs. And when I see him, I feel much better about me not being a glutton. The problem with that is, is we kind of make gluttony into a very narrow thing that's usually other people. 
But if this is a deadly sin, which it is, and scripture talks about it frequently and importantly, uh, which it does, then we have to take a closer look at it. And if we're going to travel the road to temperance, we have to understand a little better what temperance is. Well, temperance in a way is moderation. But moderation is often something fairly passive. And as we talk about Christian virtues in this series and, and in other, with the fruit of the spirit and all things like that, w- there's one thing we must remember about the Christian virtues. They are never passive. They are active. They take effort and they're important. So let's take a look now at uh, Proverbs 23, one through three, the scripture I just read, and let's read through it again and take it apart a bit. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, observe carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies for they are deceptive food. All right, as we read through this, we've gone through it twice. At first, it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what is being said here. So let's zoom in on this proverb and add some time to it. First of all, it talks about eating with a ruler. And we we could discount uh, this proverb because, well, how often do I eat with rulers and dignitaries or the president or the governor and things like that? But when it talks about a ruler, we have to think broader. A ruler represents the way his whole kingdom, which is usually a city or a a small collection of cities, all those uh, cities under that ruler are to behave like him. And so when we talk about a ruler, uh, we've got to think broader than just the ruler. And I want us to think about the general way of doing things in the culture you're in. And, and so the, with this proverb, we've got to go beyond just picturing ourselves sitting at a dignitary's table. How does the culture behave? What are the things they do? It also said about when you sit down to eat there, observe carefully. Remember last week uh, or a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, a virtue where we needed to consider the lily. And as we were thinking about considering the lily, uh, this was a way to understand our, our sin And we were trying to overcome, travel the road from envy to gratitude. But this concept of of observing carefully, of taking time to think about what's going on around us and in us is an enormous part of the Christian life. And we're in a very fast-paced culture. And in many ways, if you're like me, I love it. I love to make things happen. I love to accomplish things. I love things to change and good change to keep coming. And what can happen though, as our culture embraces that as a way of doing virtually all of life, it squeezes out the time we set aside to be reflective. Proverbs slow us down and it's telling us, observe carefully what's going on in the culture around you in the way they consume things. Then it says, put a knife to your throat if you're given to appetite. And some translations will say, if you're given to sloth or uh, to gluttony. Put a knife to your throat is a figure of speech. When I first read this, I'm like, what is going on here? But it's a figure of speech used in the ancient Near East uh, in, in the Hebrew communities. And it simply means do whatever you have to do to curb your bad desires or your propensity to overdo it. Whatever it takes, even if it takes putting a knife to your own throat to stop you from overconsuming. And in this, the, the writer of Proverbs is telling us to, to prepare yourself to see the danger of overconsumption, to see the danger of gluttony and to go to great lengths to curb it in. And it talks about 
his, the ruler's, delicacies. And these are things, our culture values. And some of them we consume and partake of uh, every day, just like the culture around us. But our culture will start to bring certain things to the forefront and give them higher value and encourage greater consumption. What are those things in our culture? Well, it depends where you live and what's going on. But certainly things like alcohol and um, uh, we're, we're encouraged to go buy more and clothing and, and our advertising world is giving us all kinds of uh, prods to go out and uh, consume more and more and more. And really, it goes well beyond food, and that's one of the important things we need to see here as we look at gluttony is uh, the many, many ways this is about much more than food. So what, what, do our, our, what does our, our culture begin to set aside as, as the higher goods? And then we're told, don't desire these things because they're deceptive. And we may have to, we may consume some of them and in certain quantities and in certain ways, it may be okay. But we're being told here, don't embrace the culture's uh, propensity to value these things and consume them at at great lengths. Why? Because it's a lie. They're deceptive. They, They don't tell the truth about what you're doing and the consequences of what you're doing. So as we move into this topic of gluttony and the road to temperance, we need to think deeper about those words. And today I'm going to talk about a different artist and his art today. And uh, this artist is uh, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol lived in the 20th century. He died unexpectedly, and really it was an accident uh, in a hospital, malpractice, as he was recovering from gallbladder surgery. He died in 1987. Andy Warhol was a painfully shy young man growing up in uh, an ethnic, small ethnic community in the state of Pennsylvania. And his uh, full last name is Warhalla. But one of his art shows, uh, when they printed the the, uh, flyer for the show, they accidentally cut the A off his name, and he just left it as Andy Warhol. And he was very talented. At a young age, he was very talented artistically. And he would go on uh, to develop his art. He'd move to New York City, and he would become a very successful commercial artist. And so he would be hired to draw things. He was very well known for his drawing of shoes for advertisements and displays and different things. And he was so good, he was probably the the best commercial artist, the most in-demand commercial artist in, in New York City. And he started to get uh, quite a bit of notoriety within that world. But Andy always wanted more. Andy was uh, very uh, open in in, uh, his uh, thinking when he talked to friends and began to articulate what he wanted for his future. He wanted to be a star. He wanted superstardom. And he wanted to accomplish a type of superstardom coming out of the world of art. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And even today, a lot of us don't know the names of the top artists in the world. The art world knows who they are, but most of us don't know them because they don't, uh, they don't do their art in a way and carry on their life in a way where they become part of pop culture. Andy Warhol wanted to do that. And if he could do that, he would become the first artist really to do something like that. Well, in his efforts to do that, he would uh, arrange to get some art shows and his first few were really miserable failures. 
his work as people would come and look at it and the, the, the inner circle of the art world and the avant-garde uh, really turned their nose up at his work initially. But then through a contact that he developed a friendship with, he got an art show out in uh, California. And for this art show, um, he had been talking with friends about what to do about uh, his art and his desire to break into uh, superstardom and pop culture. One of his friends told him he should just paint ordinary objects. And what do you like and what do you... Well, Andy Warhol, every day he would eat the same lunch. He would eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a can of Campbell's soup. And so Andy Warhol set about to paint 30 paintings, about 20 inches high each, 30 paintings, or 32 paintings, and each painting was a can of Campbell's soup. And the difference in the paintings was uh, the flavor, and he painted all 32 varieties. And so the art show was these 32 paintings of cans of Campbell's soup. And at first blush, they all looked the same. But then when you see the different flavors uh, or the different varieties, and that was the difference. And there they all were, 32 cans of paint. Well, the people came, the avant-garde came, and they loved it. And it was this art show that is going to burst him uh, on, open the door for him to move to the next level. And he developed a style of painting where he would uh, use silk screening. And he would take common objects or famous people, he, he would use, often use people who were already pop stars, and he would make silk screens of them. And then he would paint on a canvas certain parts of attributes of these people. And then he would project uh, a, a silk screen over the top of it. And he would create what looked like just a duplicate of that person, but with, uh, with a different use of color. And this began to become uh, his trademark. And he became very famous and very in style. And uh, at the same time, he began to rise within the art world in notoriety. There was somebody else who was having a meteoric rise in pop culture also. And it was Marilyn Monroe. He was fascinated by her. And unfortunately, her life and her career ended tragically. So in her mid-30s, she took her own life. And a Andy Warhol was drawn into this event. And four months after her death, he created uh, this piece of artwork, and it's called the Marilyn Diptych. And in this work, and it's much bigger than what you're probably seeing here, he created these images using this silk screen, but this repeated image in color and in black and white of Marilyn Monroe. And each face, as you get up closer, you can see they're subtly different. And this became a huge hit. But by calling it the Marilyn Diptych, a diptych is actually a, a form of art that came into vogue in the church many centuries before. And it was often a piece, it was a piece of art, often over an, a, a backdrop to an altar that could fold in half. And it, so a diptych would, would, you'd open it and they'd set it on the altar and it was usually Christ and the Virgin Mary or, or some variation of, of those two. And by doing Marilyn Monroe in, in a diptych, he's making a statement about the continuity of art, but also the spirituality of pop culture. And you can read and watch videos of people analyzing Warhol's work, and you're going to get people saying things all over the board. It's elusive, and it's meant to be, because it just is. And one of uh, Warhol's famous quotes was one in an interview, he, the reporter asked him, what is art? 
and he just had this kind of almost um, uh, indifferent, dispassionate way of talking. And he said, it's whatever you can get away with. And people just love sayings like that because they thought they were deep. They thought they were artistic. And, but it, it, there were a few people who thought it was all a ruse and a game. And in many ways it was. But what he's done here and why I've chosen uh, this uh, piece of art for our talk on gluttony today is what, what uh, Warhol did with much of his art and this piece in particular. He's showing us about how in pop culture, superstars, our stars and our famous people are turned into consumable commodities. So the real Marilyn Monroe was a person, but Marilyn Monroe in pop culture becomes a commodity. And uh, through technology, she is made into a commodity that can be consumed by everyone. And you can have her whenever you want, however you want, and wherever. And so everybody can have now Marilyn Monroe uh, as a commodity. And you can uh, consume her, if you will. We can consume our celebrities in as much quantities as we'd like. And pop culture encourages unbridled consumption. And in this painting, and in much of Warhol's work, we see him bringing that to the forefront, but he brings it in a way that he feels is at least okay, and maybe even virtuous. But he would probably say, it just is. And I want to be part of it. And we all want to be part of it. But in this, this becomes an artwork that can really symbolize how, through pop culture and technology, Things, many things other than food can be things we overconsume and fixate on. And here's the truth about gluttony. Gluttony is more than overeating. It is the idolatrous fixation on food and other consumables. In our gluttony, we reduce the good to something less so it may be consumed or fixated on more efficiently without constraints blinding us to the consequences and to the needs of the people around us. This is why gluttony is such a problem. We think of gluttony being something I'm doing to myself, but it's actually cutting me off from the world around me. And it's also cutting me off from the future and seeing the consequences of my activities. And so in gluttony, we're trying to draw life or something vital out of something consumable. And it was never meant to give that. It may be something good. A hot dog can be delicious. 74, we're probably using it to do something it cannot do. And we, uh, we do this in many different ways. And as Christ followers, we have to figure out how we do that in our own life. If it's not food or the eating of too much food, it may also be fixating on things. And maybe we're not eating a lot of food, but we're going the other direction. And so there are different ways in which you and I become gluttonous. So one way is just with indulgence. And the first and obvious one is food. And we just look to food for, uh, sometimes we'll use phrases like comfort food, but um, we begin to consume food, type, certain foods or amounts of food in large quantities, and we overindulge because we're, we're looking to life for it. But sometimes it's video things. We use phrases like binge watch of, of shows, and, and over time, this can become a form of gluttony, or it can be video games or other electronic and visual media. It can be buying we may not have a lot of money, but uh, buying a lot or looking um, 
to buy things as a continuous way to bring about happiness in life. Uh, we can become gluttonous in the way we buy. We can become gluttonous in the way we exercise. When I was younger, um, I ran a lot, did tons of exercise, but half the reason I was doing it was so I could eat a lot and it wouldn't affect me. That's a bad dynamic. That's like competing gluttonies. And so even exercise, instead of seeing the good of what our bodies can do and trying to keep them healthy, we, we overdo it and we try and extract something of relevance and self-worth out of, out of a, a gluttonous way in which we look to exercise. Or we fixate on things. And um, so maybe we're not consuming a lot, but we're always thinking about that thing. And there can even be sometimes a reverse pride with something like food. And we fixate on it and we think about it. And uh, we pride ourselves in how little we eat or how careful we are. And But even in doing that, we reduce food um, to something less than the good. And we, we see this in, our, in the marketplace. And, and if you go to the supermarket, a lot of our foods that we buy aren't, we don't buy foods, we buy attributes of the food. Rich in fiber, high calcium, omega-3. And we, we reduce the food from uh, this overall good thing that if eaten right and well, it, it uh, keeps us healthy and we enjoy it, but we don't overdo it. Instead, we try and isolate aspects of it and we reduce it to something less than it really is. And we sit around eating things um, that we don't, that really aren't very delicious. And, uh, but we do it because we're fixated on eating too little or really controlling it. Uh, social media can become a fixation. Um, uh, it can be Facebook and uh, Twitter, or Instagram, things like that. Uh, we fixate on um, d different forms of that. And the, and the media, social media that we participate in, or just the media in general, when we think about uh, the the uh, broader culture and, and the pandemic and the riots and all these things. Just think of the bombardment of videos and news articles that are out there and we're sending to each other and read this before they take it down and all these things. It, it doesn't mean that those issues aren't important, but when we fixate on them in a gluttonous way, it crowds out everything else and it actually diminishes their importance in our mind. So uh, being uh, careful with the pandemic may go down in our mind just because we've overindulged in the media surrounding it and we've just kind of sickened ourselves to it. Well, and, and there's a, can be a form of gluttony going on. Shopping. You know, so over here was buying. Here we have shopping. So sometimes we just, uh, maybe we don't have a lot of money or time, but um, we love to shop. And when we shop or play video games or even look at pornography and things like that, and that gluttony will be covered in lust. Uh, um, it, we, when we, uh, shop, dopamine is released in our brains and it relaxes us. It gives us a mild euphoria. And sometimes we become addicted to that over there or here. And, and we just, sh we fixate on not so much buying, but just shopping. And we'll look through Pinterest and on and on and on. Now those can be good things, but sometimes we become gluttonous in the amounts and the ways we're doing it. And we can fixate on making our house better, making uh, our, our yards better, things like that. Or body image. And this is related. We may overdo exercise, but we, uh, the, overall, we can just fixate on our, on our body image. And um, it, it is good to be healthy. And it's not okay to get out of control and overweight. None of those things can be unhealthy and, and have all kinds of consequences. But too often, we, we sit at the ruler's table and we see what culture says is important and it's fixated on body image. And, and so we dress that way and we fixate that way and we just think about our own bodies constantly and that fixation becomes a type of gluttony. 
So uh, to um, think about now the opposite is temperance. And our biblical story today is about temperance. And, and temperance isn't, as I said earlier, isn't just a passive thing. There's power to temperance. There's power to being uh, grateful and seeing the good in things and using them in good and uplifting ways. And not just doing it ourselves, but as a community. So what I want us to do is uh, we're going to go to the end of uh, Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 is in, important uh, in many ways, but in particular for this church and many other churches, when we talk about our six values here, they come out of this section of Scripture. And so people, the Holy Spirit is about to be poured out, but the, 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 um, the church is forming. And we're getting, at the end of Acts chapter 2, we're getting a quick snapshot of, of the church and how they're behaving. So Peter's given his speech, Holy Spirit has come, and thousands have converted, and this is how the church is behaving. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So when we read through this scripture, we can see the six values. Uh, the first thing they, they did, and it's put first for a reason, devoted to the apostles' teaching. It begins with the word of God and sitting under the word. And that's part of our worship and it's also part of our learn. And those are our first two values. So when we, when we gather on a Sunday, even virtually, we're all sitting under the word together. And so we're worshiping and we're learning and we're to take that seriously. But they're also devoted to the fellowship, to each other. And that's the relating. And we're going to see how through the scripture, they also serve, they give, and the scripture we have this morning is going to end with reach, how the church is going out. But right here, this is how we're supposed to live together. And temperance is a crucial part of what's going on in this community. They are not given over to gluttony, uh, be it food or otherwise. And so there's a power to temperance. And, and gluttony undermines the Christian community. So now we see more of how they're relating. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Sometimes I'll read an article or hear somebody talking and they'll say, well, this is biblical uh, backing for socialism. It is no such thing. Not at all. The giving, there is private property ownership. You can keep it or you can sell it. And, and there's no coerced uh, communal behavior here. But what we do need to see, it is a community who is all about being aware of each other and where each other lacks and being able to understand how my private behavior affects the community. And so if I become gluttonous in any arena, a Christian, a Christ-centered community will realize I'm not just bringing harm on myself, I'm harming the community. And there may be a, a direct harm, but it may be indirect where I'm just so busy being uh, consuming what I want that I lose an awareness of what's going on around me. And they have all things in common. And the, the all things in common is the thing they have in common is loving God and loving each other. And that's the, the glue, the cement of Christian community. And, and then as we do this, gratitude shapes our view of life together. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food 
with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So it's out of gratitude. Um, uh, temperance has power because it, it, it's uh, uh, underlying it is a true sense of gratitude for everything, that everything I have available to me, there's, it's good as God made it. And when I order my loves and keep it in the right place in my life, it's good. And I'm grateful for it. When I begin to overconsume it, I'm actually depreciating my gratitude for it because my, I'm looking to it for life instead of God. And so as I consume things more and more and more and more, I may just say, I just love it so much. But it's depreciating. I'm looking for life from it, and it's depreciating my gratitude for God. I have cut off seeing it as <clears throat> a good thing that God gave to me so I can love him and love the people around me. Then the end, the church is growing day by day. Temperance in the Christian community brings growth. People see it. They compare it to life without it, and they want it. Some will reject it, but some will want it. And so oftentimes, in, in a pop culture like we live in, churches don't grow because we imitate pop culture. Or we grow for the wrong reasons and we don't really grow Christ followers. They just found their flavor of pop culture inside a church. And that feels good. But it becomes another type of gluttony. And gluttony undermines the Christian community. And so temperance is where we get the power of gratitude moving through all we do in loving God and loving others. Apostle Paul uh, will pick up on this in, in his letter to the church at Philippi. And he contrasts those who uh, find their pleasure and their satisfaction outside of Christ and those who find it within Christ. So Philippians 3.19, he writes this, their end, those without Christ, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. Read the news, turn on the TV, pull it up on the screen, just listen and watch what's going on. And if I'm drawn to it, am I drawn to it? Am I part of it? Do I love that? Do I find life there in those things? Because it's feeding my belly. And look how, what gluttony does. It makes your belly, that inner part of you that overconsumes the good, it becomes our God. And not only that, there is glory then in their shame. They make it a virtue. When we, when we really become gluttonous uh, over consuming things, we love them so much in a, such a broken way, we begin to make it virtuous what we're doing. Well, Paul refocuses us and contrasts with the, uh, us with the Christian life. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so the contrast is, is to take all our whole life, everything, all the good things, and understand their goodness through the gift of God. And the ultimate gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so we see a proper, powerful view of temperance helps us understand who Christ is. And he's not just another consumable product for us. 
Well, for our next step today, I think uh, it's very appropriate as we've talked about gluttony and, and broken ways we consume is we're gonna take time now for communion. And the worship team's gonna come up and they're gonna lead us in a song of reflection. And when they're done, I'm going to uh, come back up and I'm gonna lead us uh, through the reading of our scripture, the taking of the elements, and then we'll close by, uh, in prayer by reciting part of a psalm together. If you're at home and you don't have your elements there ready, feel free to pause. And when you come back, start it up and you'll start right back in the same spot. So let's take time to reflect on what areas of our life may be given over to gluttony and uh, what would a Christ-filled temperance look like in our life? Within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is called. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is called. Christ is risen. 
And now for communion, as we usually do, I'm going to read part of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, and uh, then I'll read this part of Scripture. We'll take the elements together, and then I'll lead us in a closing prayer of a psalm. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take a minute now, and if you're at the campus, let's stand together and recite uh, this part of a psalm as our closing prayer. Follow with me. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of you, your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Have a great Sabbath.